Hello everyone. The topic of today's lecture is uh, the functional paradigm. Uh, we have uh, previously discussed the lambda calculus, which is the theor theoretical foundation for functional uh, programming languages. And uh, now we will go into the main characteristics of uh, uh, functional programming languages or the functional paradigm. And this is in two sections. Uh, first, uh, computations without state, and then we talk about uh, evaluation strategies. So, uh, let's uh, first uh, refresh our memory uh, regarding conventional programming languages. Uh, with conventional programming languages, we are talking about uh, uh, imperative languages like Pascal or C, or object-oriented languages like C++ or Java. Uh, and notice that conventional languages base their computational model on the transformation of the state. What do we mean by, by that? Well, we mean that the program at any given time has a particular state. That means the variables have some values and then at every step in the program, uh, the the program changes. The state of the program changes, meaning that the variables will get new values. So the the heart of this model is really the concept of the modifiable variable. If you think about it, what you're doing when you're programming in say C++, you're giving you're giving variables uh, new values. That's really what you're doing all the time changing the state of the program. So the modifiable variable is a, is a container with a name to which during the computation can be assigned different values. But the same association is always maintained in the environment, meaning the association between the name and the, and the uh, memory location. So Correspondingly, the principal construct in conventional languages is the assignment statement, which modifies the value contained in a variable. So once again, if you think about the program that you're writing in, in a conventional language like C++, you're using a lot of variables and you change the values of these variables by using assignment statements. Now, the, the assignment statement does not modify the association between the name of the variable and the location to which it corresponds. We are not changing the memory location, the association between, between the name and the location. We're only changing the value of the variable, and the variable stands for a particular location. And uh, most con conventional languages use this same computational model. Uh, and this computational model is an abstract view of the underlying physical machine. Uh, and what is this abstract view? Well, the view is that computation proceeds by modifying values which are stored in locations. And this model is called the von Neumann machine named after the Hungarian-American uh, mathematician, uh, John von Neumann. And uh, the heart of the model is that you have uh, uh, variables, you have uh, uh, assignment statements, so you can change the value of the variables, and you have iteration, so you can iteratively iteratively uh, change variables, like using loops to change variables and uh, 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 change the state of the program, really. Now, it is interesting that indeed there, there exists a different model where computation uh, is carried out without this concept of the state. So it is possible to compute without using modifiable variables. And the computation then proceeds not by modifying the state, but by rewriting expressions. And we will come uh, later to this, uh, what we mean by rewriting expressions. 
but uh, it really means that changes that take place changes take place only in the environment that do not involve the concept of memory that's what we mean by a computation without state there is not this concept of the memory as we have in the von neumann uh, uh, architecture and notice that if there are no modifiable variables then there's no longer need for an assignment because if you can't change the values of the variables then you don't need to have an assignment statement uh, so the entire computation will be expressed in terms of modification of the environment in which the possibility of manipulating higher order functions plays a fundamental role remember what uh, higher order functions are we have talked about this earlier higher order functions are functions that um, can be sent as parameter to other functions or can be sent as a result as a result value from other functions So higher order functions can accept other functions as parameters or can return functions as values. Now, if we do not have an assignment statement, then also iteration loses its real sense because notice what we're doing in, in, in an iteration, in a loop. A loop is uh, repeated until uh, a certain condition, a certain variable satisfies a condition. For example, in a, in a for loop, we do we we um, we iterate the for loop until uh, the index has reached some certain value. We say, for example, for i is equal to zero. Uh, semicolon i is less than uh, less or equal to 10 semicolon i plus plus and so i is less or equal to 10 is the is the condition and uh, uh, in the loop we are incrementing the the value of our variable and uh, using an assignment but if we do not have an assignment then the iteration really loses uh, its real sense. Uh, so in the stateless computational model, iteration really disappears. And what remains is recursion. And, uh, that, and recursion becomes the fundamental construct for, for sequence control instead of uh, a loop. So we're basically uh, replacing uh, loops with recursion and so we can say that higher order functions and recursion are the basic ingredients of this stateless computational model and programming languages which which presuppose this model are called functional languages and the paradigm that results from this is called the functional programming paradigm So a little, little, th little uh, discussion on the history. Uh, it's interesting that the functional paradigm is really as old as the imperative one. Uh, so one of the first programming languages was uh, Fortran, which was, was uh, is an imperative language, a procedural language. And the, the first uh, version of uh, Fortran uh, was released in uh, in the 1950s, uh, and at the same time, approximately at the same time, the first first functional language Lisp was released. So the functional paradigm is is as old as the imperative one. And we have actually co talked about the theoretical foundation for the functional programming languages, which is Lambda calculus. And that was in the 1930s that Alonso Church introduced the Lanta Calculus. And remember, this is an abstract model or theoretical model for characterizing comp computable functions. And uh, uh, LISP, 
as I mentioned earlier, was the first programmer language explicitly inspired by the lambda calculus, but later many others followed. For example, Scheme, which is really just a dialect of Lisp, ML, and Haskell. These, uh, here, here, here are some examples of, of uh, functional programming languages. Now, I'm quoting here um, a paper by John Hughes with the title, Why Functional Programming Matters. So I just want to read this for you. Uh, John Hughes says, the special characteristics and advantages of functional programming are often summed up more or less as follows. Functional programs contain no assignment statements. So variables, once given a value, never change. More generally, functional programs contain no side effects at all. A function call can have no effect other than to compute its result. This eliminates a major source of bugs and also makes the order of execution irrelevant, since no side effect can change the value of an expression, it can be evaluated at any time. This relieves the programmer of the burden of prescribing the flow of control. Since expressions can be evaluated at any time, one can freely replace variables by their values and vice versa. That is, programs are referentially transparent. This freedom helps make functional programs more tractable mathematically than their conventional counterparts. Okay, so there are, there are a few uh, things here of uh, importance. John Hughes says, functional program contain no assignment statements. So variables once given a value never change. So in functional programming languages, uh, we don't have variables in the same sense as in uh, imperative languages or object-oriented languages. Remember, variables denote memory location and we have assignment statements which change, change the values of these uh, that are stored in those locations. Um, in functional programming languages, we have we we have uh, uh, this uh, concept of a variable, but it's different because once the variable has been given a value, it never changes. So it really behaves like a constant. It's kind of a misnomer to call it a variable because its value never varies. Once you give it a, a value, it never changes. Now, then John Hughes says, functional programs contain no side effects. What does he mean? A, a function call can have no effect other than to compute its result. So, if you call a function in a functional programming language, you will always get the same value back. It's not dependent, its value, its return value, is not dependent on um, when it's called. It can have no side effect because it, it, it's not dependent on the value of some variables like uh, in conventional programming languages you can have variables that in a, defined in uh, uh, used by a function and the variables are uh, non-local for example so they have different might have different values depending on when the program when the function is called but in functional programming languages we don't have the the same concept of a variable because once it is given a value it never changes so you will always get the same result when you call a function. It doesn't have any side effects. And uh, as he says, this eliminates a major source of bugs and also makes the order of execution irrelevant. And it's interesting that since expressions can be evaluated at any time, one can freely replace variables by their values. So it, it, the variable uh, uh, behaves like a constant. Now, uh, 
what we're going to do now is introduce the notation that we will use when we are discussing the characteristics of, of functional programming languages. And the notation that we're going to use is actually ML syntax. ML is, a, is a, one of the better known functional programming languages. And uh, the first thing that we look at is how do we introduce lambda abstraction. Remember from, from our lambda calculus, lambda abstraction is uh, the concept of uh, function definition. How do we define a function? And here we have a statement, val f is equal to fn x, then an arrow, x times x, semicolon. So what do we have here? Well, the reserved word val, which stands for value, introduces, introduces a declaration. So we're introducing really here a name f. We say val f, and then we give the name a value. And the, the value comes after the, the equal sign here. So this declaration is used to extend the environment with a new association between a name and a value. So we have a name here, and then we have a value on the right-hand side. Notice that I'm using the, con the term name. I'm not using the term variable because I'm giving this name a value. Once I have given it a value, it will never change again. Uh, so in this case, the name f is bound to the transformation of x into x squared. So x is transformed to x times x. Uh, in all functional languages, functions are expressible values. What that means they can be a result of evaluation of a, a complex expression. The, the expression on the right hand side of the equal sign is introduced by the keyword fn. Uh, and that's an expression that denotes a function. So to the right hand side of this equal sign, we have an expression and that denotes a function. So we're basically saying that f, the name, is associated with a function, with a function that uh, has one formal parameter x, and once it has, uh, what we call this function, it uh, returns uh, x squared. Now, how do I call this function? Well, I do that very similarly to uh, what we discussed in lambda calculus. I just give it an argument. On the left-hand side, I have, an, uh, have a function name, and on the right-hand side, I have an, uh, an argument. So I can say val4 is equal to f2. And let me actually, before we go further, let me actually start SML, which is one uh, implementation of, of ML, and let's see if I can increase this font first. Right. And if I do val f is equal to fn x arrow x times x semicolon. Now I've introduced this name and the the ML interpreter will give this result. Uh, this is something we will actually talk about later what this exactly means. Um, but just uh, at this moment we could say that it fn f, val f is a function that given an integer returns an integer. Now if I want to call this function, I can say f of 2, and what I'm doing here, I'm binding the, the, the value 4, because f of, of 2 is 4, to the name 4. So the name 4 is bound to the value 4. Uh, I can also do the following. So, 
what I'm doing here is I'm again sending, uh, calling a function with an argument. In this case, it's the argument 6. And I'm calling a function that I'm writing on the fly here. So it's a nameless function. It's a nameless function that, given the argument y, returns y plus 1. So if I send x to that function, I will get 7. Uh, if I, sorry, if I send 6 as an argument to the function, I will get 7 back as a result. Uh, in general, if I have g as a function and then uh, a sequence of uh, uh, arguments a1, a2, up to ak, then this uh, means that oh sorry it, it doesn't have to really to to, to uh, you, we can look at the 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 a1 to ak as arguments but it it means that i i apply g a1 to g and i get back a function then i apply a2 to, to that result and i get back a function and all the way up to AK. Now, we talked about higher order functions, that, that that was one of the characteristics of functional programming, to be able to return functions as results. And that's that. What that is what I have here. Let me try this in the interpreter. I say val at is equal to f and x, and in the body of the function, I have another function definition. So, what do we have here? I'm binding the name at to some value, and what is the value? It is a function that expects an argument, x, and it returns a function that expects the argument, y, and returns y plus x. So the x here is bound by the x over here. So recall for, from our discussion on lambda calculus, uh, this is really lambda x and the x is bound by the lambda, and we have lambda y, and the y is, is uh, uh, bound by this lambda. So, what I get back uh, is, is a function which, given an argument x, returns an anonymous function, notice, a, a, a function that has no name, which, given an argument, y, returns x plus y. So now, I can say something like, while 3 is equal to add 1, 2. So, uh, I get back 3. But what's really happening here is that add 1, will <coughs> give me a function that when which then gets the argument 2 and will return the value 3. So this is in line with what we said earlier here, that if we have an expression, we have g and then a1 up to ak, then we first apply a1 to g and we get back a function which then expects the value a2 and so on. So that's really what happened here when we said when we have the expression at 1 2 we send 1 to the um, to at to that function here and we get back this function which expects an argument which is in our case is 2 and then adds 2 to 1 and we get back 3. But notice also that I can say well add 2 add 2. So at that point add 2 is a function 
I'm getting back now a function. In the previous example where I said val3 is equal to at 1, 2, I, get ba I got back a value. If I say val at 2 is equal to at 2, then I'm getting back a function which will always add 2 to its argument. Because when I say add 2, x is 2, and then in the body of the function, we have uh, y plus x, meaning y plus 2. So now if I say val 5 is equal to add 2, 3, I get back 5, because I'm calling the function add 2 with the value 3. So, um, I can also not notice that uh, what we did earlier uh, uh, is uh, express um, or use the keyword fn here, which is right like a, a, a when, when we are uh, defining functions that are nameless, nameless functions. But I can also give names to functions, of course. I can say fun fx is equal to x times x. So here I have fun for fun, which is a keyword, like a fun function definition. And uh, the name of the function is f, and the argument is x, and the body is x times x. But this is really just a abbreviation. This syntax in ML is, ML is just a, a nicer abbreviation for uh, the things that we had discussed earlier. Val f is equal to fn x1, which returns a new function uh, with fn x2, which returns a new function, and so on. So, uh, uh, and this is in line again what we said earlier that. Uh, x1 is the first argument and the result of applying x1 to f is a new function which expects another argument and the result of that call is a new function and so on. So this is in line what we said here. We apply a1 to g, we get a function back. We apply a2 to the result, we get a function back, and so on. And notice also that this is, in our discussion on lambda calculus, we refer to this as currying, the concept of currying. That we could change a function that expects n um, uh, arguments to a function that expects and minus one arguments, and so on, and then eliminate all the arguments all the way down to a single argument. So this is the concept of currying. So let's make a break here. <laughs>